Tripp, Holly, thank you both so much for joining me here today in New Mexico and Focus to talk about the healthcare workforce shortage. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, I want to start by getting an idea of the severity of the problem. Trip Marjorie's story had some jaw-dropping anecdotes, statistics that we saw. What did her reporting reveal about just how dire the situation here is in New Mexico, but specifically in rural areas? I mean, you know, I mean, in, in July, uh, they were short, uh, New Mexico was short 1,000 physicians, and I think we have 7,000 nurses positions short. And basically, you've got a state that's the size of New Mexico. You can fit New York and all six states of New England into it. And you have a third of the population, 800,000 people living in frontier and rural areas. And, um, you know, in New Mexico, you already have a shortage of, of physicians and healthcare professionals everywhere, but it's kind of more pronounced in the rural areas. So it's, it is jaw dropping. It's kind of crazy. Some people are driving two hours to get, you know, some care. And Holly, how does TRIP's assessment fit with what you're seeing within Presbyterian Health S Services? Where geographically are you seeing the largest needs? I think, um, I think I'm fully aligned with your perspective on this. And on top of that, New Mexico has an aging population. The population that's growing the fastest are individuals over 65 years old. So what does that mean to healthcare? It means that there's just increased complexity. There's already health disparities in New Mexico and some things that we need to shore up for access of care. But that aging population should be a red flag that we need to dig deeper and do more because of the complexities and the demands. How do the concerns from the rural patients differ from patients in Albuquerque and Santa Fe where those shortages are still persisting? You know, New Mexico is really about rural health care. Yes, we have exceptional hospitals in the Albuquerque area and can serve some of the most critical needs of our citizens in the state. But New Mexico is really about rural health care. That's where the majority of our citizens live, and it's where the most disparities are, and to Tripp's point, the most challenges. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation as we try to um, identify the top solutions, because I really think this is how do we move away from being in a crisis? How do we build on some of the stabilization that has started from some of the interventions in place? But really the macro goal is how do we get to a place of sustainability? What does that vision look like where healthcare services and how we provide healthcare, that there's um, a reliable, sustainable model and approach for how we do that, from what our government does, what we do as leaders in healthcare organizations, and then how that directly supports our citizens and their care and supports our workforce because they're the backbone and the engine about how to bring all of that to reality. Can, can I riff on something she said, Absolutely. basically, which was, you have the aging population, which is the care becomes, like you said, more complicated and more sustained, actually. It's like chronic stuff for patients and clients. But it also means that, I mean, like teachers, there are the aging population of healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have a retirement boom. And so where are we going to find people to replace this generation of workers? That's a challenge, actually, in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to riff on that because that's, that's a really important point as well. Yeah, these are, these are signals that are popping up and with increasing intensity. So today's a timely yeah. conversation to, to figure out what we need to do next. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to talk about solutions, but I also want to talk about the impact so we get an idea of how this is actually impacting patients. Is it increased drive times, like Tripp mentioned, emergency situations, making those worse, or continuity of care, or a combination of all of those? Within, it's a combination of all of those. So within rural communities, um, as we um, look at our healthcare workforce, we're gonna talk more today about how do we get more New Mexicans into healthcare careers, as well as people that we can recruit from outside the state. But ideally, how do we offer these opportunities and enable our own citizens to have um, a career in healthcare and be part of that solution? We, you know, the entire healthcare team is important, but critically, physicians and nurses are, are two important priorities, as well as EMS drivers to, to drive the ambulance, as well as social workers to help us with the social determinants of health. So all of those things come together um, into um, what our focus should be to build a sustainable model for how we deliver health care, but how we support a sustainable workforce to be able to care for those citizens. Now, Tripp, the big frame for New Mexico in-depth story wasn't just the workforce shortage, but also how legislative efforts to address it have fallen short. 
uh, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham line item vetoed several provisions last session, prompting members of her own party to sue her, as was highlighted in the story. What happened with all of that in Santa Fe this past session, and how does it fit with past efforts fr from the Roundhouse? Yeah, and I want to say, you know, we, we pointed out in the story that, that lawmakers and, and the governor, I mean, the accomplishments were kind of almost legion. I mean, they really passed a lot of stuff. Um, but it wasn't enough, you know, because there are so many challenges. That That's kind of what advocates are saying is that they passed $80 million, you know, over a three-year program to actually help build up health care businesses in their rural areas. They, they you know, basically have uh, worked to reduce exemptions and deductions on, this is tax policy, integrates with health care policy, but for, um, you know, medical providers who don't, have to pay taxes on copays and stuff like this. They've done a lot of stuff. Uh, they increase the amount of money that in, in you know for physicians who are paying back loans. They did all this and it still wasn't enough. And then the governor, there was this health care provider tax tax credit that the governor line item veto, which was kind of the hook for the story, which is it would have uh, expanded the 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 number of positions or professions that are allowed essential under this tax. Roles, essential yeah, essential roles. Yeah, essential roles, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to entice folks. It's one thing among many factors, but um, it, it came at a time when New Mexico has historic surpluses coming in from the oil and gas industry. So uh, the argument from her office was is that we were, we, I had to line on and veto these things because we may not have enough money in, in, in the future. And so that's kind of why we did the story. So, I mean, I hope that that answered the question. I was kind of like yeah. all around there, but yeah. I appreciate and, that. And you Please. made me think about just how competitive are we as a state? Because this healthcare crisis is national. The, work, the desire to have a sustainable workforce is a national concern. Other states are gonna be competitive. So as you said, good effort has been made, but how do we carry this further? Once again, the aging population and the workforce deficits that we have are huge red flags that should challenge us to ask ourselves, what can we do more? And like you said, the tax credit, how could we revisit that potentially in partnership with the state um, to really see if that could be extended beyond some providers? Yeah. Now you mentioned the competitiveness and I, I wanted to bring that up. What are you hearing from your employees as the chief nursing officer about what it's like to work in particular in New Mexico. Are there specific issues that you hear from them? So um, in the rural communities, what is real, what's a real positive is there are deep roots and connections in the state. People understand these communities. They are well connected um, in the care of their communities and what the needs are. So that's a positive in people wanting to live and work in New Mexico. And the issues that we've talked about with um, the legislation and where we can go farther and some benefits that maybe we could rethink or add or advance to help entice physicians, nurses, and other essential um, workers in both the nursing, medical, and allied health field to want to live and work in New Mexico. Um, how we can be even more organized in attracting youth to want to enter healthcare careers. The, these things are not stabilized, they're in a state of crisis. So what I'm seeing and feeling every day and hearing from, from um, colleagues um, that I work with or um, people that are employed in our health system is um, what can we do to make access to care better for our patients? What can we do to attract more individuals to wanna go into healthcare careers? So internally, a lot of the actions we're taking is to is to try to bolster that, to um, have more engagement with schools, open more slots. What does their funding look like? What do they need? We even have um, some of our team members looking to become instructors in the schools as they have faculty gaps. I mean, this is just a, a multifaceted issue that um, we even need more partnership between our state our leadership at our healthcare organizations, how can we even become more aligned to look at every single one of these solutions? Because our patients, our citizens who are our patients deserve that, they shouldn't have to worry about this. And our healthcare workforce, they shouldn't have to worry about this either. They're trying to do meaningful, purposeful work to take their skills and their expertise and heal and help people. And they're feeling that pressure at the bedside. 
they're feeling um, th the lack, some of the deficits. I, I mean, part of what we found was, and I think you were talking about this, which is like maybe partnering and instructing, getting some folks mm -hmm. in there. I mean, there are s only so many slots available for in, in nursing schools here. Mm -hmm. And the, there's, there's a uh, yeah, there's a huge debate. So up in, in Santa Fe, there's uh, this conversation about how much do you increase funding to actually pay to help increase the pipeline of nurses and growing your own workforce, which is like what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, because there's all these folks who are need help in the rural areas. And she, uh, Marjorie, um, uh, interviewed somebody who is from a rural community, well, two folks. Um, but they're both from rural communities and they're, they came from rural communities, they're back there. The, you know, there are people in these communities who can do the work, who can go to, you know, university and whatnot and get mm -hmm. nursing degrees and, 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 and uh, you know, fill the pipeline. At one of our hospitals in um, Tucumcari, um, I want to say it's the Messalands Community College, um, they were having some faculty deficits. So now we have some of our nurse leaders who are actually becoming faculty in that school to help support those programs because that relationship is interdependent in keeping that community going and ensure that we can have um, you know, people at the bedside to take care of our patients. Um, I just got a, actually a message this morning. One of my other nurse leaders um, in the Española area is partnering with one of the local colleges for the same reason. So um, we, we really need to solve this issue together and be able to Yes, in healthcare organizations, su support these solutions, be part of faculty and other things that we mentioned, and more, what else could we do together um, at the state level to open slots, help with tuition reimbursement or loan forgiveness or whatever the action is um, to be able to make this a viable solution for people that, that want to care for our patients. Okay. Now, Tripp, uh, I wanted to get to that national context a little bit more from your perspective and based on your and Marjorie's reporting. Where does New Mexico fit in terms of the rest of the states? Are we competitive with neighboring states, just the general area? I, I mean, I, you know, in some ways, Holly would be, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll I answer, but um, Holly probably knows more about this than I do. But I mean, let's take, you know, Medicaid provider reimbursement rates. I mean, Arizona it has higher reimbursement rates. Medicaid is the, you know, the government health insurance program for low income folks. Arizona has a higher reimbursement rate. That's just one thing. I think uh, to Holly's point about being competitive. Um, it, it's a national issue, but frankly, you know, it's international. We're taking folks from other countries to actually help, help fill slots. Um, so um, as far as uh, competitiveness, I think every state out there is doing things. Mm -hmm. And you have, we're right next to the second most populous state in the union, Texas, which has a, a lot of wealth and they're gonna be spending, I mean, you know, they have a lot of wealth there. Um, I, I mean, we're competing with some really tough competitors. That's my sense. Spot on. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Yep. I feel va validated, thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate you both. And I know we just scratched the surface on this. Um, I hope to have you both in here uh, in the future to talk about this problem, because I know it's unfortunately not going away in a heartbeat, but I appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.